Okay, good, good day, everyone. Welcome to our uh, Acts Bible study. Keith, how you doing? I am doing great today. How are you doing, Father Mark? I'm doing uh, great as well. Keith, I love your background there. It's looking, uh, it's looking super cool. Uh, <laughs> well, thanks a lot. Uh, I, you know, music was always uh, or is always been a big part of my life, and I was kind of a, I don't know, I'm, I'm into like hardcore and punk and stuff like that. So this is all stuff from. I don't know. I got a big record collection, and and uh, I'm into all that. So this is just where I set up. So I don't know. I got drums it back look, here. All yeah, that. it looks it looks it looks really nice. Um, one of the things, that part of your story, is you started working kind of as a youth minister, and your youth group just boomed. Like it grew um, in a remarkable way. That would have been partly because of. The, the music were you bringing some some really good worship into the your youth group yeah so i i um started a band with my with my youth group kids and back back then none of them even played instruments so like i kind of said hey you're gonna be a drummer you're gonna be a bass player we started a band and and um we had a basically it was like a youth worship service every week and we recorded mm -hmm. our own worship cd and Played all around, did all. So yeah, music's always been a big part of, of who I am and what I do. And you went like w when you started the youth group, there was a certain number of people, and that grew to. Do, do you want to give us some numbers? I remember when you shared oh, your boy. testimony. I was like, dude. Yeah, I mean, you know, when we started, it was this is a long time ago. It was like 1995. There were like 12 kids in the youth group when we got there. This was a little church of about 250 people. Uh huh. And it started to grow in a couple of years and, and I think around like 2000, 2001, we were seeing 250, 300 kids come in every single Wednesday night in a church wow. of about 250. Yeah. And so that, yeah. that caused the church to grow. And it was, it was, it was a pretty cool thing. And that it was right around that time that I started to learn about Catholicism and, and it took me a while, but eventually of course, you know, I became a Catholic. Yeah, well, listen, that's that's very impressive to be able to grow a youth ministry uh, from twelve to a couple hundred. Uh, I, you've got something to teach. You've got something to teach us. Let's take a look at chapter five of the Acts of the Apostles. You want to take us away? Yeah, let's go ahead and pray first, though, if you wouldn't mind. Oh, if you'd, if okay. you'd lead us, that'd be great. Sure. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Okay, so today we are looking into chapter 5. And sorry, we missed a week, you guys. We were, uh, both both of us were traveling last week, so we were unable to do this, but we're back at it today. Chapter 5 is a pretty, a pretty well-known story. It begins with, you know, the church is growing, and there's a lot of people coming in to follow the disciples right away. And as they're doing that, people are, are bringing what they have to the apostles and saying, hey, let's, we're forming this community. So all the believers gather together, they bring their possessions, and they're kind of living in this, this interesting way where nobody has any need. And, and we see chapter 5 begins with a, a, an account of what happens when a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira, it says they sold a piece of property, but with his wife's knowledge, he kept back some of the proceeds and brought only a part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your own disposal? How is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and died. Wow. He fell down and died. And great fear came upon all who heard it. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, Tell me, whether you sold the land for so much? And she said, yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, 
How is it that you have agreed together to tempt the Holy Spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of those that have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she found she fell down at his feet and died. When the young men came in, they found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. Wow, so, I mean... You've probably taken a lot of offerings in your church over the years, Father Mark. Have have you ever wished something like this would happen right there in the middle of the church? I mean, what uh, what is your reaction to something like this? I mean, it's it's a scary story, eh? It uh, certainly it shows that the church, even in the early days, not everyone was perfect, and good point. Um, and also, people, you got things like this happen. People are taking God seriously. They're realizing that this, like, this isn't a joke. This is this is a God who who has to be taken taken seriously. So, uh, yeah, it's a it's a scary story, <laughs> no doubt about it. You know, I think some people, as I've studied this in the past with people, I think there's a there's a temptation if you don't look closely at it. To say, oh my goodness, God is really greedy. He demands that, you know, everything that we have belongs to him or he's going to kill us. Is that really what you see happening here? What do, you, what do you think their sin was? Was it the fact that they didn't give all the property to, to God or was it something else? Well, I mean, obviously, Peter says, like, you could have kept it and you, or you could have, like, that was up to you. The, the issue was they lied to the apostles, who remember, these are the representatives of Christ, and they have the anointing of Christ, mm, yeah. the power of God that was that you know flowed through our Lord Jesus was was breathed on the apostles, and now they have the authority of Christ, and for for Ananias and his wife to think they can deceive the apostles was foolish, and and it says. You know, Peter says, how is it that you agreed together to tempt the spirit of the Lord? And so, um, yeah, so it's it's not an issue of having to give everything you have to God. It's, it, you know, and, you know, there is a gravity uh, to sinning against th- the spirit. Like when you know in your heart that the spirit of God is, is asking you to do something and you deny that, thinking that, oh, I can, you know, get away with this, it's just... No, and God is God. It is. It's still the all holy God um, of the Old Testament. God. God is unchanging. Obviously, He's a God of great mercy and love, but uh, still to be taken very seriously. Yeah, I, I think about it like it's not even so much the fact that we're, you know, unwilling or unable to give everything. I, I feel like the truth is. When, when I look at my own life, I, I'm overwhelmed oftentimes at how much I, how far I still have to go when it comes to turning over everything to God. You know, mm-hmm. I have these moments where I feel, okay, God, I'm surrendering myself to you. I'm giving this over and I, I and I, I can commit in my mind and my heart to say, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to pray more. I'm going to give more. I'm going to serve more. But then I don't always... I don't always live up to that, you know, if I'm, mm-hmm, if, mm-hmm. and it's, it's convicting, right? Yeah. And I feel like, I think that the, the chief sin for Ananias and Sapphira is, is the deception, you know, it's, yeah. it's the willing deception to say, I'm going to put myself forward as someone who is giving everything to God and, and, you know how Jesus talked a lot about not to do your righteous deeds to be seen by others. Okay. Yeah. This is a manifestation of that. This is yeah. Ananias and Sapphira saying, we're going to show other people how righteous we are by giving this, these proceeds from this, from this land sale. So they're in essence, they're saying, check me out. I'm so holy. I'm so righteous. Here's everything. But they know they've planned. They've orchestrated this to hold back. And and I think that's what Peter, why Peter says to them, why have you lied to the Holy Spirit and to us? You know, yeah. I think that Jesus accepts us for 
right where we are, you know, in our, in our, in our, even in our, our state of, of unwillingness to give him everything, he doesn't turn us away and say, nope, come back later. He says, I'll take you the way you are, but I'm going to push you and challenge you and call you to a higher level of holiness. But we have to first be honest about where we are. Mm -hmm. If if Mm -hmm. we're not real about where we are in the first place and we're not humble and we're not, um, you know, aware of our sin, as the Bible says, you know, if, if mm-hmm. we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Yeah. You know, but when we admit that we have to, when we confess our sin, he's faithful and just, and he'll forgive us to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But first we have to say, man, I am a wretch. I'm a, I'm a greedy, selfish, prideful person. Jesus, take my heart with all of its issues. I, I help me turn from this sin and to repent and follow you. But mm-hmm. when we say, um, I'm going to show everybody that I'm great. I'm going to put forth this false perception of myself. God sees right through that, doesn't he? Yeah. You know? They say, they say too, it might have been, you know, kind of like a, a school teacher when, when she starts teaching. Unfortunately, one of the approaches is you just make an example of the first kid who mm-hmm. misbehaves oh. you know, to kind of send a message that don't mess with me. You know, like I... I love you, students. Uh, this my dream is to help young people to learn. I want to be good and you know, all that. But the bottom line is, don't mess with me. And the other thing too is now this is this is speculative, and I might get criticism for suggesting this. But we know that God is a God of infinite love. He is love. He's a, he's he's a fire of love, and we know that we are shielded from His love because if we knew how much he loved us, we die of joy. Our bodies, our psyches, they don't have the, the capacity to to just be in the full light of God's love. Um, in the next life with our glorified bodies, we'll have a capacity to just take in the full radiance of the love of God. And I like to think that the Lord, again, who is all mercy, he took their lives by just giving them a little glimpse of how much he loves them. So my theory is, they died of love. You know, there's still probably a, you know, a judgment and a purification for, um, you know, their, their, their sin. And I mean, I don't, I don't know that. I don't even attempt it. But the same thing, you know, the story in the Old Testament where the Ark of the Covenant was about to tip over. Yeah. And the one person reached out to uh, save it. Yeah. Again, I always thought, man, the guy just died of love. You know, he, he touched, he got huh. too close to love. He just died of love, you know. And it, it, it's an example to all people that, hey, you know, treat holy the things that are holy. Um, but that's speculative, you know, uh, that's speculation. Um, but it, again, it is true. God is God is love. And even they say hell is the mercy in hell is that God actually does hide himself because his love is, is more powerful than like the, the torch of a welder. And it would be a greater torture for the the damned souls in purgatory to be in the full radiance of God. So God you mean, is mercy. You mean hell, not purgatory, right? I, I meant to say hell, yeah. So to be in to be in hell, to have the full radiance of God's love shining on you would be a worse torture than to just simply the absence of God, even though that's an unspeakable torture too. But this is all speculation. I like to throw it out though. Huh. <laughs> you're, you're, you're getting me thinking here. Well, <laughs> let's let's move on in chapter five. So. The next, the next thing that happens, and I'm not going to read every verse, but, but I encourage you guys out there to read these verses. But for the sake of time, I'm just going to kind of summarize some of this. So the next thing that happens is the apostles are are seeing these amazing miracles happen. They're continuing to heal their 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 uh, the people and and do ministry. And one thing that I think is interesting in chapter fifth or verse fifteen is it says that they even carried the sick into the streets and laid on them beds and pallets. That as Peter came by at at least his shadow might fall on some of them. So there's like this powerful manifestation of the Holy Spirit coming through even the shadow of Peter if it falls on them, you know. And as this happens, you know, the the council, the Jews, the the high priest, the Sanhedrin, you know, they're, they're like, we can't have this. Now remember, these are the people that killed Jesus. These are the people that hauled Peter and in, in before them, it said, stop preaching in the name of Jesus. You know, 
knock this off. Mm-hmm. And he basically said, you know, that Peter and, and uh, John said, we, we're not going to listen to you. We got to do what God says. So, so it t- they take them in verse 17, the high priest rose up and all who were with him, that is the party of the Sadducees filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the common prison. But at night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and taught. You can't stop God and you can't stop God's yeah. church, you know. And it makes me think yeah. about this, you know, everything that, that we wrestle with today in the church and, and, and in our own lives. The thing that we have to always remember is is. God and his church will not be stopped. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's important even in our own lives, you know. Um, we sometimes have, it seems, roadblocks put in front of us or doors uh, shut in our faces. But if we're, if we're men of faith, we know that when Jesus says yes, nobody can say no. Like you're saying, mm. you can't stop God. And I think all of us, in our lives, we've had times where people have tried to shut us down, and sometimes we'll try to fight that. But sometimes it's better to say, "Hey, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll just wait and see what God does, because I know if He wants this to happen, He'll see to it that it happens." And again, sometimes when someone shuts a door in our face, it's because the Lord is using them to put us on another path or to, you know, for us to take another direction. So uh, it's always dangerous to overtake matters into our own hands. I mean, it's one of those things sometimes in life you do, I mean, you do need to take matters in your own hands, but it's, it's just that delicate balance. I mean, you know, for me as a priest, there's times where again, uh, because I'm under obedience, you know, you're, you're, you're told to do something when you think that what you're doing is just so good and so important. And, it's it's important to to just remember that you're a man of faith and that if the Lord wants something to happen, he'll make it happen. And so let's not get too anxious or too worried or, or too up in arms about this. Let's let's just allow the Lord to, to work his I don't want to say work his magic because he's you know he's not a god of magic, but you know, to to, to do his thing. And we see this, you know, getting them out of the angel opens the prison doors and they're back at it. You know, that, that just really spoke to me right now when you were saying that. Um, sometimes I feel like, I know in my own life, I've had moments when I've really, really wanted something to happen. Mm-hmm. And I've prayed and I've just begged God and said, this is what I want, Lord. This is what I want. And sometimes it's happened, but a lot of times it hasn't. And there can be a frustration that sometimes, especially when it might even seem like it's a godly and good thing. When you're Mm -hmm. trying to do something for the kingdom or you're trying to do something for your faith and it doesn't work out, a door gets shut or something comes against you and you, and you get frustrated You say, God, I don't understand. But what we have to remember is, and and acts five is is a good example of this is that when God is behind something, you can't stop it. So, one of the things that happens is while, you know, these, these Sadducees are in the Sanhedrin they're, they're, and the Pharisees, they're trying to stop these apostles by putting them in jail, but the angel lets them out. You know, God's, God's people cannot be stopped when God is, is behind this. And so they go out and they preach, but then people are saying, what are you doing? And, and in verse 27, they brought them out. They set them before the council. This is the apostles. And the high priest questioned them saying, we strictly charge you, I'm in verse 28, we strictly charged you not to teach in this name, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, I love their courage here, Mm -hmm. we must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at, at his right hand, as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Now it says when they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill him, but check this out. 
But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, held in honor by all the people. I think this man was the Apostle Paul's teacher, we, we learned later. Mm-hmm. Stood up and ordered the men to be put outside for a while. And he said to them, men of Israel, take care what you do with these men. So he's talking to the, to the Sanhedrin. He says, be careful what you do with these apostles. For before these days, and then he, he says, Thaddeus arose claiming to be somebody. And a number of men, about 400, joined him. But he was slain. And all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean arose in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He also perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of men, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might be even be found opposing God. Wow. (laughs) That message is just, I mean, woe to me, woe to you, woe to all of us if we've ever done anything to oppose people who are, you know, in in the will of God. And we have to have that trust. You know, as as a lot of us are worked up right now about stuff in the church, take heart that that we see that if, if what's happening currently is of is of men and yeah you know, it's gonna fail ultimately it might not fail mm-hmm. right now mm-hmm. it might not even fail within our lifetime but mm-hmm. ultimately god will prevail what mm-hmm. he will mm-hmm. do will prevail and and in your own lives you know our own lives if what we're doing is of god let's listen to that promise if what we're doing is of god it cannot fail mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean that's it's these. This is classic, you know. This this passage here. Um, I guess one kind of qualification is you, you always have the person who says, "Oh, I, I don't need to listen to my parents. I listen to God." You know, I don't yeah. listen to my teacher. I listen to God. I don't need to listen to my pastor. I listen to God. Um, don't need to listen to my bishop. I listen to God. And there's 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 a distinction here. You see, before the death and re- resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, it really was, you know, the the, the, the Pharisees or the Sadducees. Who, who, it was the Jewish religious leaders who sat in the chair of Moses, and they were they were to be, you know, obeyed. They were the legitimate shepherds. But Jesus said to the apostles, "Now you sit on the twelve thrones of the twelve tribes of Israel, and all authority in heaven has been given to me." And then he breathed on them and said, "Go." So now the official authority. The official pastors, um, the official you know apostles, are the uh, the the apostles and and their successors. And so, as 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 Christians, we do believe that the authority of Christ has been passed on through the apostles. That's why we say the church is one holy Catholic yeah. and apostolic. And so. Um, you know, there's that reality. And there's also, you know, as as leaders too, when you're dealing with people who are you know, getting into something, there always has to be um, just a, a spirit of Gamaliel. Like, let's not be too quick to just shut something down. Like a lot of people, we, we started, for example, with your example, you started with a youth group of 12, it grew to a, a youth group of, you know, hundreds. Well, you know, some people might have said, well, I don't like that kind of music. You know, or, oh, they or did. you know, what's <laughs> yeah, and so again, it's nice to to kind of have that spirit of Gamal and say, listen, let's let's not be too quick to shut this down. Let's let's wait and see. Let's let's offer some pastoral guidance, some suggestions. Um, I mean, obviously, when you're dealing with a situation where blatant heresy is taught or or, or obvious. Um, uh, misbehavior that you have to shut it down immediately. Um, but, but, you know, when you got people kind of coming forward, or, you know, in, in the Catholic Church, there's there's apparitions of the Blessed Virgin Mary, there's mystics, you know, who have healing gifts or stigmata, who claim to be getting revelations from Jesus, and so on. There's, there's quite a bit of that. And again, generally, the idea is, well, let's not be too quick. And the church is known for taking her good old time with stuff, you know, like, um, yeah, so 
I was reading about a German mystic who died, I don't know if it was in the 60s or something, but her life is just, just phenomenal. She lived for years with not eating anything except for, for the Eucharist and that. Um, but, you know, the church is just beginning the process of beatification. And, and you think, wow, with such wonderful phenomena, you'd think the church would just instantly recognize her, her sanctity, but the church doesn't operate like that. So, Yeah, I, th- I think it's important as Catholics that we read this text and, and we don't in our minds, because I think I used to think like this a little bit before I was a Catholic, but we, you know, we don't want to take that and feel like it gives us individual permission just to go off and do whatever we want mm-hmm. and say, hey, you know, I'm of God doing this, so leave me alone. You know, yeah. I think what this is doing, this isn't something that is to be applied to every little specific area of, um, you know, every inkling we have of what we should do. I think it's to mm-hmm. be applied ultimately in its in its context, which is the apostles that Jesus commissioned were now given the authority by him to teach about Jesus, right? Mm-hmm. And what the, the, the Sanhedrin had to do was recognize that, in, like, you, like you just said earlier, this was God's plan for his revelation to, to the world of, of truth. His plan was that these apostles would, would bring the gospel to the world. So we need mm-hmm. to take that for what it's worth and take it at face value. And I think it's important, you know, like you said, the principle there of waiting to see the fruit of things and how they play mm-hmm. out is important. Mm-hmm. But this doesn't give us a carte blanche to do whatever we think we want to do and then look at everybody else and say, well, you know, leave me alone. I mean, there's got to be authority. There's got to be structure because that's, that's, I mean, that was what we saw in Acts chapter five. I mean, the beginning of five yeah. is this authority where people bring these things to the apostles. Yeah. And and they exercise that authority. So, uh, but wow, what a prophetic, what a prophetic statement to make in 39, you know, but if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. Mm-hmm. You, you might even be found opposing God. And and indeed, that's what they did. You know, they opposed God. They, they, that's what happened. So, but I like what happens in, in verse 40 here. So they took his advice and when they called in the apostles, They beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day Mm -hmm. in the temple and at home, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. I mean, I don't know. I think we can sort of gloss over the part where they were beaten again as if that's no big deal, but that's not a party, you know, that's not fun. I don't. No, no one's ever yeah. beaten me for the sake of the gospel. And, yeah. and if they did, I don't think my first gut reaction would be to rejoice. Yeah. Um, yeah. When I, <laughs> when I read this, I mean, I'm just filled with a holy envy and even a, a yeah. shame. Like, I, I mean, I wish I had that holy recklessness, the fearlessness to, to just be a fool for Christ, you know, to just not care about what people think and keep proclaiming the Lord Jesus uh, I mean, I, I look at my own life. There's, you know, where I, I, I hesitate so often. I'm still concerned, you know, in some ways what people think of me and all that. And these guys, like you said, they, they took a beating. They rejoice, and they nothing, nothing stopped them. And you know, that's what really the world needs. You know, more than I don't know what you know, great thinkers or theologians or philosophers, we need fearless saints, Amen. the likes of St. Francis of Assisi, St. Francis Xavier, and go through the list. Men and women who, they don't care about anything else but that the Lord Jesus is preached, and they don't, you know, fear, they don't fear men, they're just kind of wanting to, to proclaim the gospel. And again, again always in the context of, you know, legitimate, legitimate respect. So like I said, the, the child has to be obedient to his parents, again, with within reason. You, you're never obedient when, if you're asked to sin. Again, uh, as, as, as members of parish, there's a certain obedience to our priests. Priests need to be obedient to the bishops. Um, but within that, you know, place, 
to to still be fearless in 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 preaching the Lord Jesus. I mean, I think it's it's a tragedy if a Christian ends his life having never experienced some good persecution, hmm. like some legit persecution. I was reading about uh, the in Russia when, when the communists took over, they would take the Christians and put them in chains and and whip them. And so a lot of the Christians had the had the marks on their wrists and on their backs, and that was I mean that was bragging rights. Like the, wow. the Christians who had that, they they had respect, you know. And and guys who had those those scars on their bodies, they you know they they wore them with with great pride, you know. Like say and and I mean if if we if if we've been a Christian for many years. And we don't have some good persecution stories or just hardship stories or, you know, losing friends, being laughed at, being, you know, shunned, like all of, all of that shunned. Um, to me, we, we might have to ask ourselves if we're doing something wrong, you know. So, hmm. yeah, very inspiring. That's a, that's a lot of food for thought, you know. Um, wow. I need, to, I need to think more about that because I can get bent out of shape if, you know, somebody says something negative about me or, or makes a mean comment about something or, or whatever. But the fact is it's nothing compared to, to what these and others go through and have gone through. And, and, you know, Jesus said, blessed are you when you're persecuted for the sake of the gospel. That's, that's a powerful thing to think about. Well, that's, that's really how chapter five wraps up. And, you know, as we move into chapter six, we're going to see a little bit more as things pick up with the persecution, and and pretty soon we, you know, we move past the the beatings to actual, uh, you know, we're gonna we're gonna see our first martyr um, in in a, in a couple weeks, and you know, I encourage you guys to, watching this to follow follow along, read ahead, be studying, take take some time and, and look through Acts chapter six, and 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 pray as you do, and and ask the Lord to reveal to your heart how how you can devote more of yourself to him and, and just be real about where you are in your faith and 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 then keep that close to your heart that whatever you're doing if it's if it's wholly offered to the lord he he's going to provide for you he's going to take care of you he's going to give you opportunities to serve so uh father mark i want to thank you for waking up early this morning yeah, and uh going through this with us and and my pleasure um would you, would you be willing to to close us and give us a final blessing today in the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we do ask you to fill our hearts with the fire of the Holy Spirit so that we too can be fearless proclaimers of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, give us give us courage and give us, give us the joy that the apostles had. So may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. All right. Thanks Good being so much. with you, Keith. Take care. God bless. God bless you.